So my goal by the end of this, hopefully 10 minutes, will be for you, the Legal Academy, um, to think a little bit more critically about the infrastructure that underlies our law teaching. Um, so your course materials and even the software that um, is used to distribute this course material, your course materials. All right. So it's often said that legal education, law schools, we're not a factory. We don't make widgets. You can't compare us to anything else. We're special snowflakes, la, la, la. Um, and I would disagree with that. Not the special snowflakes part. We're definitely special. But the fact that whether we are interacting with students, creating problem sets, writing case books, um, even our scholarship, or finally, even, believe it or not, the committee reports that you churn out, all of them are making a widget. And what our widget is in law schools is what you could call an idea. idea are, ideas are the root of culture. They're the, the thing with which we measure a culture or any sort of um, unit of uh, cultural um, diversity. So an idea, you can split up into three separate kinds of ideas, all in increasing levels of complexity. The first one is data. Everyone knows about data nowadays. Big data, everyone loves it. And what data is, is basically a fire hose of information coming at you. It's unorganized, it's really hard to use without some sort of extra work involved. Um, it's just a big blob of stuff. Then there's information. Information is data put into context. So a lot of this could actually be done by machines. Um, but what it does, it just makes it a little easier to use your data and um, makes it so that you can somehow process it into the third type of information or of uh, ideas, which is knowledge. And knowledge is information, which is data with context, so information made usable. So there's added value put to it. So some sort of explanatory material, something that you can easily go on, um, use, and have a greater understanding of the original idea. There is a ton of data in the world, but not so much information and very, very little knowledge, which is unfortunate because everyone wants knowledge. And they kind of want some information, and no one really cares about data, although hopefully the big data revolution will change that. But the exciting news is y'all are in the knowledge business. Finally, someone wants legal scholarship. This might be the first time you're told it's valuable within like the past month or so. So just to give you an idea, this is a chart I made kind of emphasizing what some examples are of data, knowledge, and information. So law is data. The way it's produce, produced by the courts, produced by agencies, that is data. Organized into a chronological order, that is information. And then annotations, indexes, those are knowledge. On this um, education front, questions, a PowerPoint slide, that is data. The, um, a problem set, syllabi, an entire PowerPoint presentation you've made for your class, that is information. Knowledge would be a casebook, a textbook, all of the kit that you have going into that you have that you can make a turnkey course into. That is knowledge. Now, as there are three types of knowledge, or three types of ideas, there are three aspects to an idea. The first one is content, your stuff. And that's basically what we talked about before. The idea is your content. Secondly, is the container with which you contain your content. Is it a book? Is it an article? What form does it take, basically? And then finally, there's the conveyance. So it's kind of easy, the three C's. The content, conveyance, and container. The conveyance is how your material gets distributed. Is it sent to a um, bookstore and your students buy it? Is it distributed through the free internet? Is it behind a password on uh, Westlaw or Lexis? That is the conveyance. So the reason why I told you we went into this kind of librarian-y definitions is for one reason, because I need to tell you why everything's messed up. Everything is decidedly not awesome right now. Um, publishers, corporate IP attorneys, they really have rigged the game against you, the consumer of information, the creator of information, um, to keep you from doing lots of things that you usually could do. They have um, electronic information, electronic knowledge, 
is treated differently than the old-fashioned print knowledge. It's impossible almost to own elect an electronic book. How many of you have a Kindle or read Kindle books? Do you think you buy Kindle books? Guess what you don't? You're leasing that Kindle book. At any second, Amazon can take it back from you. Um, they also use proprietary uh, formats in which you distribute it. Lexus and Westlaw both have special little containers that they put their e-books e into that if you're not a Westlaw subscriber and have access to these um, containers, you won't be able to use it. And also, corporate attorneys have lobbied Congress, and now copyright is extended far more longer than it was ever originally contemplated. So basically now nothing goes out of copyright. And if you think about the fact that Disney lawyers were the real push towards this, it's kind of ironic because most of Disney's early successes in movies were based on public domain fairy tales. And yet they push for no more public domain. Um, and then right now with the internet, there's lots of digitization going on, lots of stuff's on the internet. But unfortunately, if we can't find out who owns it, it's called an orphan work. And right now, 50% of digitized materials are orphan work, and so they're essentially unusable by anyone. And finally, things that you would expect to be no-brainer public domain materials, such as the law, the raw material with which we teach, is not published in any ways that are open. Some states even slap copyright notices on their law. So it's very problematic. Basically, most information, both, most knowledge right now, is locked behind um, either a paywall or otherwise is inaccessible to you. And I mean, I admit I'm kind of a hippie and I think all information should be free. But the thing is, information has been paid for several times already. So let's take one of your um, pieces of scholarship. So you're paid to write an article. Then some law journal gets it and they love it and they're gonna publish it. But there is a school that is paying for you know, a faculty advisor. Um, this is law, so we don't have to worry about peer review. But there also there is a school there making some money, or investing some money in the running of this law journal. Then your school library buys the print journal so they can have in your collection and have that nice brief or case there that has all the faculty material or faculty writings. But then your library has to buy a subscription to at least three databases, so it will be in a format that someone will actually read. So how many times do we need to buy this information before we say enough? But now after that, there is some good news. I'm not a De total Debbie Downer. Technology today has rendered much of the work of publishers unnecessary. There's a reason why they call this desktop publishing, because you can publish materials on your own. And the internet has made it so we don't have to rely upon publishers to distribute our information. We can, again, do it all on your own. So what I want, what I hope, is that we as a community can start to take some ownership back of the materials that we produce and the materials that we use in legal education. And the way you do that is through open. You've heard these words before, probably, and you probably didn't know what they mean, but don't worry, stay tuned open access, open source, that is the way we're going to solve this problem. And to explain what open is, it's sometimes re easy to say what it's not. Um, open stuff is free. You don't have to usually pay anything to use it. But that's kind of a minor part of it all. Um, price really isn't an innovation. A lot of people worry that free stuff is junk. It's just part of our capitalistic system. If I'm not paying for this, it's obviously not worth anything. Um, that's not true. As an example, I could say every image you see here in this PowerPoint is a Creative Commons licensed, free to use image. So if you think these are all junk, <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is just an example of some of the things you can get totally for free. You don't have to give up ownership of your material if you want to make it open or licensable. Creative Commons is a license that pl you place on your material. You still own it. You can limit who uses it. Um, you still can keep control of your material, just other people are allowed to use it. And open stuff should not be locked away in a way that it's not obvious that someone can use it. So our precious SSRN that we upload everything, 
And somewhere in there, you say it's Creative Commons licensed, but it's in a PDF, and it's, you don't have that copyright license notice very, broad, very obviously uh, noted. Um, that's not quite open. But really, most things are a combination of open. So it could be open content, but a locked container, like the PDF on SSRN, or vice versa. Um, basically, what you have to remember is, if it's remixable in some way, it's open in some way. So remixable is the goal we're looking for. Um, open source versus open access. Open source basically is the, the software that is enwrapping our content. Open access is the content. And there is one special kind of open access material called open educational resources. And this is a thing that I am spending my life working on. And um, one of the things that you can co contribute to. So any of your PowerPoint slides, any of your class notes, any of your problem sets, even your old exams, all of that you could choose to license and share with your colleagues so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Studies have often show, also shown that if open educational materials increase student retention um, just because they don't have to worry about buying a very expensive casebook. And, you know, I'm, there's not, there can't be 250 ways to teach torts. You know, we all are teaching the same courses over all of our law schools. So um, there's got to be a way that we can share this information and make it easier for us to teach these materials. So, going forward, this is what I hope you would do. Consider creating some uh, open license material and sharing it with your colleagues. Um, use open source software. Don't put anything in a locked format that people can't use or remix. And as part of the academy, start um, uh, bothering your legislatures and your courts so they start publishing their material open in an open fashion. Thank you.